Thanks very much, guys. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Snare or Lucas. I'm from Melbourne, Australia, which is a really long fucking way away. Um, I work at Azimuth Security, doing some computer stuff, uh, like most of you guys, I guess. Uh, you might have seen my talks in the last couple of years about EFI, you know, firmware persistence stuff, and, you know, OS 10 kernel, you know, fuckery. Um, my buddy Resin, who did this research with me, um, isn't here because he's like being a grown up and writing a PhD thesis or something, uh, which he decided was too important to tear himself away from to come and drink all the beer. But um, yeah, so I'm presenting on his behalf as well. He did all the hard stuff, um, which you'll see later on. So basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Thunderbolt DMA attacks. Uh, People have been talking about DMA attacks, you know, for years, and we've seen lots of Firewire stuff. Um, and then Thunderbolt became a thing, and people were, were just like, "Okay, cool, you, this is totally a thing. We can do DMA attacks." But um, same thing as, as what I did with the EFI firmware persistent stuff. I hadn't seen anyone actually do it, so I was like, "Well, I'm going to do it and sit, you know make sure it's it's all it's all good and learn a few things in the process." Um, Resin, th uh, you know, thought the same thing, and we we had a couple of conversations about it, and. Uh, He's, uh, he's like an FPGA guy. I probably should have done his intro thing. Uh, yeah, he's a you know FPGA nerd, and he's at uni doing his PhD thingy on FPGA stuff with ray tracing. Um, so yeah, we you know got together and messed around with some some FPGAs and some PCI Express and whatnot, and uh, came up with this stuff. So I'm going to go through a little bit about like the the history of of, of FireWire DMA attacks uh, and how all that stuff works. Uh, a bit about Thunderbolt and how it fits together. Uh, some PCI Express stuff because that sort of fits into this as well. Like what an FPGA is and how it works for those who don't don't know because I sure as fuck didn't before I started this because <laughs> I'm a software guy. Um, and, and how we put all that together in our approach to attacking Thunderbolt. And there's a, like, I, I didn't actually bring my like demo kit because I've been traveling around the world for two months and I didn't want to carry this Pelican case around the world. So I've got a, a video instead of the sweet Sunhack demo. Sorry. Um, and then I guess there's a few slides on defense because some people care about that. Um, so, Firewire DMA attacks. Uh, I think, I think uh, like, actually, just like on the bus, DMA attacks, old mate Joe over here did one of the first ones of years ago um, with his Tribble board, which was pretty neat. Um, I, I think the first, uh, the, the first Firewire DMA trick like like stunt hack that I that I ever saw was this crazy dude at Apple called Quinn the Eskimo, who if you you know ask arcane kernel questions on the Darwin kernel mailing list or file DCS like tech support incidents at Apple, he'll usually answer your questions in great detail and you'll wonder how the hell he knows so much about it. Um, so he did this thing in 2002 um, where he connected two Macs together via Firewire and drew a screensaver on the other Mac's frame buffer over the Firewire thing with DMA. And he was like, hey, look at this, this is cool, right? And all the evil people went, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is cool. Um, and then Metal Storm, a couple of years later, uh, did a talk at Roxcon where he um, you know, did this winlock prone thing where he you know, connected two machines together via Firewire, wrote to, you know, found a bit of code on, in, the, in the Windows winlog on thing or whatever that does the authentication routine, uh, you know, knocked out some shit and made it so he can just like type any password in and hit enter. The, the attack that we now you know, commonly now know is Inception. So this is the, the sort of the common tool to do, to do that attack. So uh, Firewire DMA stuff works by using the SPP2 protocol, um, which is sort of part of Firewire. Uh, and it, it basically just like you send a you send a command over the Firewire bus uh, to the, the chipset at the other end and say, hey, hey, please do like said, some DMA reads and writes to uh, these regions of memory, and it does it. So you can do that. You use that to like do a, take a full memory dump of the system, like and stream all the data out the Firewire interface, so you can do your Winlock pwn. Uh, inception, hacks, whatever. So it looks kind of like this. You know, we've got our target host there. Uh, we've got the PCI Express bus at the bottom um, and the Firewire chips that connected to it. And we've got the analysis host, you know, or the bad guy, whatever, um, attached over Firewire. Our Firewire chipset says, bro, please read some data at this address. Dude says, yep, okay, does a DMA read on the PCI Express bus and sends the data back or whatever. Um, there's a few limitations to this attack um, that are becoming more and more relevant. Um, for starters, it requires that there's a Firewire interface. That's not a big problem on like you know current Mac systems or anything with an Express card slot because you can just like attach one to the PCI Express bus 
uh, via Thunderbolt or via Express Card or some other expansion, you know, expansion bus thing like you know maybe one of the docking interface like uh, you know docking interface things or whatever. Um, the the one of the one of the sort of probably you know more important limitations is that FireWire uses 32-bit addressing, so you can only access the lower four gigabytes of memory, which wasn't a big problem, you know, when FireWire attacks became prevalent. But now, I mean, my like crappy te uh, travel laptop has eight gigs of RAM, so you know if the code uh, that contains the uh, you know authentication routine happens to not be in the first four gig of memory, you can't do the the screen unlock stunt hack, and if you want to do memory acquisition, well you can't acquire all of memory. Um, furthermore, on Mac OS, uh, the FireWire driver has a little bit of code, which I probably should have put in the slides, but it's just like, if secure mode, um, which basically means if we have uh, FileVault 2 enabled, so we've got full disk encryption enabled, and the screen is locked, then tell the FireWire chipset to not do DMA anymore, right? Um, so that basically means that when the screen's locked, you can't do the, stunt, the screen unlock stunt hack on, uh, I think it was like 10.7 and later or something like that. Um, sound right? Yeah. So that's, you know, that's kind of a bummer. So yeah, there's quite a few limitations that make Firewire not the best option these days for that kind of thing. So the way that, you know, Thunderbolt DMA attacks have been done thus far is just kind of cheating with Firewire. So it's just, you know, connect a Firewire adapter to the Thunderbolt port. Um, and you know, hence the PCI Express bus, and then you've got a, a FireWire chipset, and you can just do the same old attacks that you could do with FireWire, with, with like an onboard FireWire chipset. Um, so it's basically the same as an onboard FireWire chipset, and it's basically subject to the same limitations as an onboard FireWire chipset. So there's you know, only four gig of RAM, um, you know, blah, 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 screen, screen lock thing, doesn't work, et cetera. Um, so, there's probably some more stuff we can do with Thunderbolt because it's basically just PCI Express and DisplayPort glued together, and then like some GPIO and you know through this like 10 or 20 megabit um, ser uh, gigabit serial connection, right? Um, if you look really closely, you can actually see the pixie dust there where it's all stuck together. Um, that's that's up like one of Intel's official you know marketing diagrams with the pixie dust there. Um, so yeah, I figure you know we can probably send DMA requests directly over the PCI Express if we connect to the Thunderbolt port. Um, so this is sort of what the Thunderbolt uh, controller like layout looks like in a, in a system. Um, we've got four lanes of PCI Express. That there's now more with Thunderbolt 2. Like if you've got a newer machine with Thunderbolt 2 going into, uh, and you've got DisplayPort or going into the Thunderbolt controller. Uh, and then we've got this you know 20, 20 gigabit. Uh, link between the host and the device, and then at the device end, we've got another Thunderbolt controller that's probably potentially the same as the, the one at you know, the host end, or it could be like a DSL2210 or whatever, um, that just splits out PCI Express and DisplayPort. So you've essentially got PCI Express and DisplayPort outside of the case, the same way that you've always had you know, Express Card, um, Card Bus, do docking stuff, whatever, outside the case, which is, sounds like fun, right? Um, so inside the PCI, uh, sorry, the Thunderbolt uh, controller itself, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, ignore the bit where it says Mac and PCI Shazzy. I stole this from Apple's like diagrams uh, from Apple's documentation, but PCI Shazzy could just be like any other Thunderbolt uh, device. So we've got uh, the PCI switch, and then a Thunderbolt switch. Uh, PCI Express goes in there, uh, goes through the PCI switch. And you know becomes fancy 20, 20 gigabit uh, Thunderbolt connection comes out the other end, and then we've got PCI Express coming out the other end. And we don't really care about Display DisplayPort for this because we can do DMA with PCI Express. So a little bit of background on PCI Express because uh, I didn't really know a lot about this before I started, and uh, Resin did because you know he's doing all this crazy ray tracing stuff. So this is only stuff that he talks about, so it's not really my uh, my area, but um. So PCI Express uh, is the main system bus, right? It's a it's a serial point-to-point -point interconnect, uh, you know, bunch of lanes uh, that are negotiated, link set up. So you know, you can have your like 16-lane fancy graphics card, um, and like use a Dremel to like cut the end out of a one-lane slot and just stick the 16-lane card in there, and it'll just go. Oh, there's only one lane connected electrically, so I'll just do, use one lane. So it's all negotiated at, at link set up, and you know, works neat like that. Um, which is kind of good if you you know want to do like 
Dogecoin mining or whatever. You just put a bunch of cards in your 1x slots. Um, each lane has like, you know, just four wires, a TX and RX like differential pairs, just using differential signaling. Uh, same way that, you know, the microphone cable works apparently to, uh, you know, cancel out noise. I'm not much of a hardware guy, but that seems legit to me. Um, it's, you know, kind of like a, a lot of networking protocols. It's layered, packet-based, um, you know, transaction protocol. It's three, three layers that we care about, physical data link and transaction. Uh, and all the communication between you know, endpoints and the root complex is done with uh, TLPs, transaction layer packets. So that's kind of what the stack looks like. Um, we've got, you know, the transaction layer data link, physical layer, um, link in between, and our sort of device core being, you know, maybe an Ethernet, um, Ethernet core or whatever. Uh, so this is kind of what the PCI Express bus layout looks like. In a typical single CPU system, uh, we've got the CPU there uh, connected to the root complex, which is sort of the you know the main uh, you know main endpoint that, to which everything else is connected. Uh, you can have you know PCI switches or PCI Express switches to like connect a whole bunch of devices through. Uh, you know you, you might have an endpoint connected directly to the to the root complex there, uh, and then you you know there's potentially bridges to legacy protocols like. Uh, or legacy bus uh, architectures like PCI or PCI-X. Um, and you've also got the memory connected directly to the root complex, which is you know, where we do our fun DMA stuff. Um, so we've got four transaction types. We, uh, we only really care about the memory reads and writes, um, but there's also IO reads and writes, um, which is kind of deprecated now. Mostly everything uses um, like memory mapped IO. Uh, but you can do IO reads and writes, configuration reads and writes, which are, you know, we, we can write to a device's configuration space and, and tell it, you know, to, to enable some mode or whatever. Uh, and there's memory reads and writes and messaging. So messaging is like, you know, interrupts and stuff. So for DMA, we basically, you know, if, if you connect a device, uh, like a graphics card or whatever, uh, the system will be like, okay, you need bus master because you need to like, you know, write to some DMA buffers that you've allocated in the kernel or whatever. Um, we can, you know, write a target address and a command to the device and it'll do some stuff and then it'll write it all back um, to memory and then it'll send an interrupt when it's finished. So there's a table that I stole from probably Intel. I think one of the Intel uh, presentations that everyone steals uh, diagrams from, uh, which I think I've put in the references. Uh, so we've got memory reads and writes, uh, IO reads and writes, config reads and writes, messaging, and then the completion, all the completion messages are like the ones that, you know, the, the, the other endpoint will send back to you when it's done, whether it's, you know, with data or um, an error or, or whatever. Okay, so FPGAs. Um, everyone know what an FPGA is? Nope, yep. Has anyone done any FPGA development? I mean, you guys obviously have. Uh, so, for a software guy, it's uh, you know kind of daunting because it's not actually like you know you're writing code, but it's not really code. It's like circuits, um, so it's yeah kind of ridiculous. But uh, so an FPGA is basically like a reprogrammable chip, you know, reprogrammable IC that you can do lots of different stuff with. It's just you know a big array, big matrix of slices, which each contain like a you know lookup tables, flip flops, carry chains, you know, it's all some some fancy circuity stuff that I don't really know about, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of other, you know, features that FPGAs can have to make different types of, um, you know, circuits easier to build, like DSP stuff and, you know, block RAMs and whatever else. Um, and also, there's, you know, a bunch of FPGAs that have device-specific features, like, you know, might have a full Ethernet core in silicon, so you don't have to implement all of that stuff in logic. Um, you know, DDR RAM on the chip, maybe even like a hard uh, microcontroller core, like the Zinc. FPGAs um, or PCI Express transceiver, which is what you know we're kind of interested in. So yeah, I guess the important thing is it's reprogrammable, and you can basically you know do the job of lots of other different types of ICs on this on this one thing by like programming it in a certain way. Um, so that's kind of what a lot looks like a lookup table. You know, it's some fancy thing that can rep represent all different types of gates in one thing, depending on how you program it. So yeah, that. So this is basically me, like, um, doing FPGA stuff. Um, that's, like, I just, I, I, I don't really get it. Um, I, I'm starting to get the hang of it. It's, it's kind of hard, but um, Resin knows all about this shit. 
Um, so another feature um, that we see on, on some of the uh, Xilinx, well, it's not really a feature on the, on the, on the, on the uh, FPGAs, but something that we can implement in, in FPGA logic is uh, Microblaze, which is uh, basically a soft microcontroller that we can implement on the, on the FPGA. Um, so it talks to the AXI bus, which is you know, the, sort of one of the microcontroller equivalents of uh, the PCI Express, so the main system bus. So all your phones probably have an AXI bus with all the peripherals connected to the CPU, whatever else, so they can all talk to each other. Um, and it's uh, basically like uh, like memory mapped. What the hell? Yeah, uh, memory mapped into into the microblazers like uh, uh, memory space, so we can talk to the to the bus. Code for you know microblaze or any other soft microcontroller we can write in like whatever, and then compile it to um, uh, compile it to, to binary for the microcontroller. So in this case, we just write code in like C or C plus plus as a full API like a, a SDK thing for for microblaze development with AXI which is quite nice. So it's, it's really useful for writing control logic um, rather than building these overly complex state machines in VHDL or whatever. Uh, you know, so noobs like me can write C code um, that will tell them you know, chunks of FPGA logic what to do, which is, which is great. Um, it also you know, implements a UART so we can you know, plug in a USB cable into the um, uh, FPGA development board, connect to it to, to serial and then like like, F, like printf debug out the serial port, which is great. Rather than like, um, you know, the way to, to debug the actual logic is, is um, you know, insert like a uh, uh, logic analyzer core and then um, you have this, you know, chip scope display with lots of like square waves that apparently mean PCI Express packets. Um, so how do we do, actually do PCI Express uh, with this guy? Uh, the AXE, there's an AXI PCI Express core, which is just a bridge between a AXI and PCI Express. Um, and that gets memory mapped into the Microblazer's address space, so we can kind of, you know, just do like memory reads and writes um, to set up registers and do uh, PCI Express TLPs, arbitrary t uh, PCI Express TLPs from our memory space, so we can sort of do whatever packets we want rather than have to, having to use um, uh, an, an, like an API that builds the packets for us. We can just specify everything, which is kind of nice. So Thunderbolt, um, talking to Thunderbolt from the, from the FPGA, um, I use this, uh, this B plus TH05 board, which has uh, since been like scrubbed from their website. Every single reference to this board has been removed as far as I can see, except for that image, which I stole from the B plus website. Um, so for, like when I, uh, when, I, when I got this board about I think maybe three or four weeks later, one of their representatives emailed me and they were like, so we're recalling all of the TH05 boards, so if you could send it back, that'd be great, we'll give you a full refund, blah, 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 we'll pay for postage, cool. I was like, yeah, I don't know, I kind of need this board, um, and I don't really want to go out and buy like an $800 like Magma enclosure, because I you know, was just dicking around with this and didn't have any money. Um, so I said, eh, like, what's, what's actually the problem with it? And they're like, no, we, you know, we don't really want to go into it, but, you know, you should definitely send it back. We'll, um, you know, we'll give you, like, you know, a couple hundred dollars credit um, on our web store as well as your money back, and we'll pay for postage. And I'm like, all right, no. All right, we'll give you, we'll give you 500 bucks credit. You can buy all this other stuff on our web store, and we'll pay for postage and give you your money back. I'm like, yeah, I'm just not going to return your emails now. So I asked a friend of mine at Intel, um, if you'd heard of this company, it was like, don't know, man. So I, I, I assume that you know someone told them to stop fucking making Thunderbolt stuff without you know licensing their tech or something like that. Um, but yeah, th there's actually uh, plenty of other Thunderbolt enclosures on the market now. So I mean, actual enclosures with you know you can put a video card in and and talk Thunderbolt to a uh, PCI Express card. Um, so. This is kind of what our you know, setup looks like. We've got our target host there, connected via Thunderbolt to the TH05 board, uh, which is connected via PCI Express to the Xilinx SP605 board, which is just a, an FPGA development board that we, that we bought uh, from Abnet or whatever. It was like 500 bucks. Uh, and then you know, on that FPGA, we've got implemented an AXI PCI Express core and a Microblaze processor. So the... Uh, uh, PCI Express like transceiver is actually implemented in in like hardware in in uh, in silicon on the FPGA because the FPGA that we use is too slow to 
talk, like, you know, full speed PCI Express and, you know, stuff like that. And then we've got a serial connection to our, you know, bad guy host just to, to do debugging and, and, and tell it what to do and whatnot. Uh, so this is kind of what our, you know, the layout looks like now. We've got the two, two hosts connected together over the Thunderbolt connection, which effectively extends the PCI Express bus out the Thunderbolt port and then back in the Thunderbolt port of our, you know, bad guy analysis host. So now our FPGA can just do uh, DMA operations directly on the PCI Express bus, which is great. That was our goal, you know, from the beginning. Okay, so we've got an, this FPGA that talks PCI Express over Thunderbolt, so what do we do with it? Well, the first phase of our testing stuff was to write a driver, um, kernel driver for Mac OS that um, is loaded on the, you know, on our uh, target, you know, just for testing purposes, and it, like, you know, does config reads and writes, and uh, uh, makes the FPGA device bus master and then tells it what to do. You know, we've, so we've set up our, um, at this stage we didn't actually have a microblaze, we just had like this awful state machine that we could tell what to do by writing some stuff to some, some registers on the device. So the next phase um, was actually to imitate another device. So um, rather than, you know, use our driver, which is cheating, and we're obviously not going to be able to use in a real you know, real world attack scenario, we need to make our FPGA um, PCI Express device imitate a device that the system knows about and we'll load a driver for, allocate some DMA buffers, set us as bus master, configure, you know, whatever, you know, access control stuff, ACS, blah, 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 on the PCI Express bus. Um, so I'll take a little uh, tangent back to, to, FP, uh, to uh, PCI Express here. So, um, some of you guys might know this stuff from like, you know, trying to get graphics cards to work on Linux and shit like that. Um, config space is basically just this block of, um, block of data presented by the PCI Express device and just gets memory mapped into kernel space, um, which contains a bunch of properties for the device. Like there's a vendor ID, device ID, there's like base addresses of um, like registers that are mapped uh, from the device. So, you know, if, for example, you've got a SATA controller, there'll be a set of registers um, for, you know, for communicating with it to talk SATA, whatever. It's like capabilities and a bunch of flags, like bus master and shit like that. Um, so, I, I don't think I actually explained what bus master means. Bus master is like a legacy thing, sort of, from PCI where, you know, you had, so PCI and PCI Express are, are, are kind of different, um, but they've, PCI Express was designed to look kind of the same, um, whereas the, like the, their architecture is actually quite different. So in PCI, you had to have you had to tell a device, "Hey, you're you're the boss now. You're the you're the bus master, and you can uh, you know go and do reads and writes to memory all you want. And then when you're done, we'll like switch someone else to bus master so they can do their shit." But PCI Express doesn't really require that, um, but the flag is still there because they wanted the bus to look kind of the same. Um, yeah. So convex space looks, you know, somewhat like this. Um, we've got like some of the important things, like the device ID and vendor ID there, um, class code and revision ID. Um, I'll explain a bit, a little bit about what this is used for in a sec. Uh, same as subsystem ID and subsystem vendor ID. Got the base address registers for, uh, you know, the uh, registers within the device that uh, we want to talk to. Um, expansion ROM base address, which is kind of fun as well. Like if, if a device has an expansion ROM. Uh, you can stick a driver in there that the uh, firmware will load or the BIOS will load when you when the um, device is connected at boot time. So, for example, if you have a SATA controller that you want to boot from a disk that's connected to it, um, the BIOS has to know how to talk to the SATA controller, right? Um, because the BIOS has got to be able to read the operating system off the disk that's connected to it. So, you can provide um, a driver in your expansion room that can tell the BIOS how to talk to it. Um, so I did some some fun stuff with that a couple of years ago, um, whereby I wrote a, a, an EFI uh, driver. It doesn't actually help you talk to hardware, but it just like injects stuff into your kernel when the when the system boots. Um, so you can actually do some some pretty fun nasty stuff with that. Um, yeah, that guy. So IO Kit, um, kind of jumping around all over the place a little bit here, but IO Kit is uh, on Mac OS is like. The, the, the chunk of the kernel and all this framework stuff that handles uh, device driver loading uh, for the majority of drivers. 
it's all implemented in C++ and <laughs> is horrible to reverse engineer because of C++. Um, basically, like it does all this, this driver matching stuff. So a new device is connected on the PCI Express bus, and IO Kit like looks at the config space and goes, okay, um, well, we've got this vendor ID, we've got this device ID. Um, I'm going to go look for a driver that, that, that understands how to talk to this vendor ID and device ID. And it goes through all of the, um, the, uh, the info plist files um, in all of the macOS uh, drivers that, are, that are in, exist in the system, tries to find one that matches. So it can also match on like the class code and revision ID. So you might have like a standard, you know, a standard protocol um, or a standard architecture you know, that you can talk to like SATA, you know, there might be like, you know, uh, a, a standard for talking to SATA devices in the kernel or whatever, so, you know, you can say, well, I'm this kind of SATA device with this revision, any driver that can talk to that kind of device will know how to talk to me. Uh, so, we've got the info plist file there in the, in the uh, device driver that, you know, has some stuff that corresponds to the device ID and vendor ID there. Uh, so, the, the, the device that we're imitating um, is the Apple SDXC slot. Uh, which has this uh, name, which is generated from the uh, vendor ID and product ID. Uh, and also has this flag, IOPCI tunnel compatible, which basically tells IOKit that it's allowed to load this device driver if the device is connected over Thunderbolt or, you know, tunneled uh, PCI Express. So we had to find one of the, one of the, drive, uh, one of the drivers that allowed this IOPCI tunnel compatible flag. Um, and had an easy name for us to match, like just by by vendor ID and product ID, and nothing complicated. Um, so yeah, the proof of concept that we built around this was basically, you know, the same sort of thing as Winlock Pwn or Inception, where um, you know we find the uh, the code that does the authentication for the logon screen or for the you know screen lock uh, logon. Uh, by doing some DMA reads, and then we do a DMA write, like an MWR TLP. Uh, to overwrite the code with something that makes it not do what it would normally do, i.e. always like say yes, you can authentic you authenticated successfully. And then we win. Uh, so that's the code there. It's basically just like, you know, call the authentication function um, and then like move the result of the authentication function into AX and return it. Um, so basically we just overwrite it with like move one into AX and then return one all the time. Uh, so this is what our uh, our hardware looks like. We've got uh, this SP605 FPGA development board uh, with the FPGA on that fancy looking VGA package there. And because like uh, pretty much all the, PC the uh, FPGA boards that have PCI Express support, um, they're kind of designed for people who are building like Ethernet, new Ethernet hardware and that sort of stuff, or new networking hardware. They have like all of the other features that you could possibly ever have on a fucking development board, so they're huge uh, and usually quite expensive. This is one of the one of the cheapest ones around. Um, yeah, you can see it's got like Combat Flash and like SFP slot and fucking DVI, Gigabit Ethernet, like everything everything else on that board as well. Um, then we've got our TH05 Thunderbolt to PCI Express board connected to the PCIe finger uh, in the middle there. And then the Thunderbolt connector there, which is connected off to the, to the uh, victim. So this is what uh, the whole rig looks like. We've got our um, JTAG and the UART connected to the, to, the, to the board. And that's just for sort of debugging and like telling it what to do. Um, we also implement it so you can just like press one of, the, one of the buttons on the FPGA board and it'll just do it. It doesn't need any interaction with our attack host. Um, and then we've got Thunderbolt connected to the victim and the hairiest alpaca in the world there um, who's actually doing the attack because he's a bad guy and he does that sort of thing. So in case that didn't make sense, uh, Garth's going to explain it for you. Maybe. Why are you no sound? Well, this is no good. There was sound when we started. No? Okay. Well, I hope you understood it because Garth can't explain it to you now. Okay. Oh, there it goes. I'll access a secret military spy satellite that's in a geosynchronous orbit over the Midwest. Then 
I'll ID the limo by the vanity plate, Mr. Big, get his approximate position. Then, I'll reposition the transmitter dish in the remote truck to 17.32 degrees east. Hit West Star 4 over the Atlantic, bounce the signal down into the Azores, up the Comptat 6, beam it back to SATCOM through transmitter number 137, and down to the dish in the back of Mr. Big's limo. It's almost too easy. So I hope that made more sense than my explanation. Um, he's much better at explaining that shit than I am. So, um, yeah, so we, I made a video of the actual attack as well because, like, I didn't want to bring all the hardware around the world. So, so <laughs> there's, uh, there's, you know, typing a single space into the, uh, to the uh, target machine there, showing that it's, you know, not going to authenticate with that password. The password is not a space. Uh, we connect the uh, FPGA board via Thunderbolt there. As our serial console talking to the FPGA board. We go unlock, please. So it's searching through memory, looking for the um, bit of code that does the authentication routine, finds the code um, and patches it. And because there's eight gig of memory in that machine, we're going to let it sit there and keep going and, until it hits the end of memory, just in case there's multiple instances of that code that need to be patched, which has happened a couple of times. I'm not sure why I didn't never really looked into it, but yeah. So now space, enter, and the screen's unlocked. <laughs> and the otter is looking pretty frightened that we unlocked his machine. So yeah. So uh, Intel, you know, figured this probably wasn't a good idea, right? Um, which kind of makes sense, you know, if you like security and stuff. Uh, so the options are basically like, you know, glue all your ports shut. Um, probably not the best option. Voodoo curse, eh. Um, or, you know, put some access controls uh, on device I.O. through PCI Express, which is what they decided to do. So they built this thing called VTD into all their new chips. Um, so basically it's, you know, just access control in the, the PCH um, that, you know, when uh, PCI Express, you know, DMA reads and writes hit the, the, the PCH, it goes like yay or nay based on access control sort of tables. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the basic gist of it. So it actually was designed for, for virtualizing I.O., which is kind of cool. Um, so basically, you know, if you're familiar with VMware, um, that's how VM Direct Path works on ESXi or whatever, you can take a device and just like map it right through to a, um, to a guest. So DMA requests and interrupts get remapped the same sort of way that you, you know, EPT works for, for shadow page tables. Um, so, the VTD unit, which is actually in the um, in the PCH, there has like this concept of domains, where there's uh, you know uh, you can a, a domain generally represents um, a, a virtualization guest. So there's at least one domain, which is the host, you know, the host OS's domain or the VMM's domain, uh, and then for each guest to which you want to remap a, a device uh, or you know pass through a device, you have a, another domain set up, uh, and then assign that device to it in the remapping table stuff. Um, so, the OS 10 kernel configures VTD for you. It just configures one domain. So, you know, there's no support for VM Direct Path style uh, pass through. There's just this host domain set up, and that's all. Um, so, the, the, the IOPCI family device driver, when it is loaded, uh, you know, creates this domain and assigns all of the devices to it, and that's it. So now when, when uh, uh, DMA, uh, sorry, when, dri when kernel drivers allocate DMA buffers, the allocator um, goes and talks to the VCD unit and goes like, hey, I want to allocate this um, DMA buffer to talk to this device. Don't let anyone except this device write, read or write to this DMA buffer. And it can actually be more granular than that. It can say, you know, only let this device read from this DMA buffer because it's a one-way, you know, data transfer from the kernel to the, to the device. Or it could be the other way. It's, you know, the, the device is only ever going to write to this DMA buffer. Or yeah, it could be, could be both. So the VTD unit now knows about all of the regions that devices need to read and write from. And it ha sets up this uh, context table um, of all of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the ACLs, basically. So then if you deny access, you get this sort of thing on OS X in your, in your console log, um, which we saw heaps and heaps of when we were doing this development stuff. Uh, so VCD has been implemented uh, in Ivy Bridge. So Ivy Bridge and Haswell and, and, and Forward ha has this tech in it. Um, it does require the OS to configure it. So I mean, as I say, Mac OS 10 configures it since 10.8.2. So 
uh, Windows before Windows 8, I think it's only 8 and forward actually configures VTD. So Windows 7, if you're running Windows 7 in uh, you know, boot camp on your MacBook Pro or whatever, um, you'll be vulnerable to this attack. If you're running an old version of the operating system uh, of OS X on your, on your Mac laptop, you'll be vulnerable to this attack. Um, Linux also configures VTD and it just always sets up a domain per device, uh, I'm assuming because it you know, sets up uh, things for KVM to be to be um, you know, able to pass through devices, or you know, maybe in future, I'm not sure what, whether KVM supports that or not. Um, so like, that's basically what I just said. You know, Pre-Ivy Bridge machine, you're always owned because it doesn't have VTD. Um, if it's an Ivy Bridge or later machine um, and you're running less than 1082, you're owned. If you're running a current OS on a current machine, you're probably not owned. Um, so I mean, there are some, you know, some gotchas with that. Like there's, there's plenty of stuff that you can read and write uh, over, over Thunderbolt, depending on which device you pretend to be. Um, so there's still chunks of memory that are allocated for DMA buffers and stuff that's just, you know, has access controls that allow you to read and write it. So if you want to attack a driver or something, you can, you can, you know, read and write to those buffers and, you know, something bad might happen. Um, there's plenty of other, you know, uh, attack surface, I guess, for this, for this kind of thing, even, even uh, given VTD. Like, uh, you know, actually emulating a device, um, you know, to a certain extent and then starting to misbehave uh, when, you know, to, to, you know, send some malicious data down some certain code path in the driver and see what happens. So that's, that's pretty much uh, the gist of it, I guess. Uh, the next, next steps for this research, some of which we've sort of started to pursue uh, a little bit, like make the kit smaller. Is, is, is probably a good one, one good thing, like uh, Joe Fitz did this thing called Slot Screamer, um, which is kind of similar to what we've done. Uh, we've talked a lot uh, with him over the last six months or so. So he's using a USB 3380 chip, which is a USB 3 to PCI Express chip, uh, and you can, from the USB 3 side, tell it to do DMA on the uh, PCI Express bus. Uh, I think the only limitation with that is that it's 32-bit uh, PCI Express, so it's still only four gigs of memory that you can access with it. But it's pretty cool and it's, it's fucking tiny, so it's uh, much better in that regard. Um, so yeah, bypassing VTD is uh, definitely desirable because that's the big uh, stumbling block in being able to do DMA attacks. So we've, you know, we've made some, some inroads into that and there's plenty of uh, attack surface to, to mess around with VTD. Um, maybe see if we can do it without imitating a device. There's a few different, you know, different ways we can look at doing that. Uh, actually implementing full memory capture to make this a forensics tool would be kind of good. Uh, at the moment, it's, it, it basically is just a one-trick pony with a stun hack. Uh, but the development board we have, um, you know, has a, a gigabit Ethernet interface and some other stuff, so we could basically, you know, implement a, P, a PCI Express um, Ethernet core on the FPGA as well, and then stream data out the um, the Ethernet interface. Uh, actually injecting payloads into the kernel using uh, or, or into processes using DMA. We started to look at that a little bit. Um, after some really basic proof of concept stuff to be able to, you know, find the, um, uh, you know, the allocator data structures in the kernel and, you know, kind of allocate some pages and, and uh, write our memory to them and then patch the kernel somewhere to jump into our payload kind of thing. Um, and as I said before, like driver, uh, exploiting uh, vulnerabilities in drivers as well. So, you know, finding vulnerable code paths within drivers for various PCI Express devices and uh, triggering those by, em by emulating some of the protocol that the device talks. Um, kind of breeze through all that really quickly. Uh, still got a bit of time left, but that's, that's, uh, that's some, some references there. If you want to have a look, I'll uh, give the slides to the crew to chuck up on the website or whatever, so you can get those things. And um, yeah, any questions? Joe. All right, this is a software question, so you might like it. It's probably a really dumb one, too. <laughs> so when you're searching through the memory with your stunt hack to try to find you know, some address to patch for that login, what, are, what exactly are you looking for there? Uh, it's kind of, it's pretty cheap, the way that it works at the moment. Like, I, I, we, we sort of started to, to implement it a little bit cleaner and su supporting more versions, like with, with signature stuff, but at the moment it's basically like, uh, we know what the target OS version is, so we're looking just for a chunk of code that 
is big enough to only occur once most of the time, probably. Yeah. So if it occurs more than once, it, we're, we're just patching it anyway and hoping that it's not something important. Right. Um, it, it, it's, it usually only occurs once. It's a couple of times occurred twice. And we're like, uh, I hope that's just another copy of the, um, another copy of the, the code. But we're, it, we're actually looking at um, a specific offset within each page. For, for that code, for that code, so it's. I mean, we know it's always. I mean, regardless of of uh, uh, address space layout randomization, it's going to be at the same offset within the page. It's just it'll be on a different page um, if it's randomized. So, uh, yeah, we're basically just looking for. I think it's like maybe uh, 20 bytes or something. Actually, no, it's less than that because I think it's, uh, I think it's nine bytes because it was like we had to do two 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 uh, different like two separate uh, TLPs. You know, for for eight bytes and then for the next one or whatever, like yeah, um, yeah. Cool. Thanks. No worries. Anyone else? Hi, I missed uh, the first part of your presentation. Sorry. So if my question was already in that no part, please reply. Sorry. <laughs> Um, within FireWire, remembered uh, especially on uh, on Apple Mac, there was something like a locking mechanism that DMA was only available if the user was logged on. Um, is there a certain situation with uh, with with this technique uh, also possible? Sure. So I, I I mentioned that related to the Thunderbolt to the FireWire thing earlier. Yeah, that's like there's some code in the IO FireWire family driver that when FileVault is enabled and the screen is locked, it disables, uh, it tells the FireWire chipset to disable DMA and not do DMA requests anymore. Um, there could potentially be, you know, a way to implement that, but it would have to be done in the Thunderbolt controller, which I, I, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a mechanism for doing that in hardware. Like there's not actually a feature that I'm aware of in the Thunderbolt controller uh, to do that. Uh, and when I say I'm not aware of, um, it's nearly impossible to get documentation, data sheets and stuff for those chips because fucking Intel. And then <laughs> I, I asked them very nicely if I could you know, join their developer program and they were like, crickets. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and then I asked them again and they sent me a, an email like three weeks later saying, yeah, yeah, someone will contact you in the next two to three months. I'm like, okay. Basically, unless you're like Belkin or you know, someone like that who's gonna sell a million units of something, they won't give you anything. Um, so, I mean, it's gonna take uh, you know, guys like like Joe to to actually reverse engineer the the chip and figure out what the fuck's going on there. Um, I poked around with a little bit from software, uh, but yeah, I don't know. There, so there may be some access controls in there that I'm not aware of, uh, but uh, yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Please. I, I ran a bit early, so ask questions. All right, thank you very much, guys.